Hey! How you doing, mate? You I'm good? good? I'm good. Um, nice to see you. Nice to see you, nice. Welcome to Mustard HQ. Start, right? <laughs> Trashing the bloody place. Just breaking everything already. This is Darren Mostyn. So if you don't know Darren, Darren is a fellow YouTuber talking about DaVinci Resolve, but primarily talking about the colour page. Because Darren is a professional colourist. So I'm here to learn. We're going to have a nice little sit down and chat. We're going to try and learn some <laughs> stuff. I make no guarantees. And I've got some of your questions to throw at Darren as well. So we're going to have some fun, we'll run through some stuff and hopefully you will find it useful and yeah, we'll all just have a generally good time. And he won't let me see the questions, which is rather annoying. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> cool. So we're going to start off with a real simple one. How did you get into colour grading? Wasn't a traditional route. <laughs> <laughs> so I studied, uh, I don't know, uh, I started studying photography. So I studied photography at art college. I became an editor. So I worked for a nonlinear manufacturer for a little while because it was the start of nonlinear editing. It was 1994, this is, so I've been around the block a bit. <laughs> I've seen some tech developments, I promise you. And I've got two floppy disks there from the original Adobe Premiere. That's 1.0, running on Windows 3.11, very old school. So I saw nonlinear developer from the very starts when it was you know, pretty clunky to becoming quite efficient and the tools, I did a lot of sport highlight editing. Um, so we did you know, tennis, uh, snooker, football, all that sort of stuff. We then started using some of the tools because the computers were getting faster, the software was getting better. So we could start doing color contrast and saturation, things like that in real time. So that was the start of me sort of dabbling with color on my edits, but I got my first lucky break, really. Well, it wasn't a lucky break. I, I was, I, I edited a documentary for BBC. It was a long form documentary. And I actually graded it as well. So I did this in Final Cut Pro, which is the, the original Final Cut Pro. So, and that had some pretty good color grading tools in there. And so I color graded this documentary just so when we presented it to, for viewing, it looks better. Uh, but I was only supposed to be the offline editor for it. We took it to Soho. I went along to the grade as well, just because I was really fascinating to see it all working. And the director actually preferred my grade. So we went to a top Soho facility and the director actually preferred my grade. And I got all his grading work after that. So it was all BBC stuff. So that was my first big sort of yeah. broadcast break really. I had, I didn't have any of this kit then. So I had a Tangent Wave, which I bought. So it just give me a little bit of control. So it's like the three balls and just give me a little bit of saturation control and things like that. I had a big broadcast CRT monitor. So it's a huge, big, heavy two man lift job that was sat over there. Great big, it was massive. It was like a Sony BVM. It was like, a, it was the industry standard, but that gave me color accuracy. And so I was offering color grading services. And because it was then affordable, Blackmagic bought DaVinci Resolve systems mm -hmm. and the resolve as we know it today was born. was started was yeah. born yeah so i've been on it since the very beginning since since uh black magic bought davinci systems and uh, so that's 13 14 years ago something like that yeah. so it then became really affordable and then obviously i've accumulated this kit over time and we've got a ready ever since <laughs> brian pavilion there you go our most famous icon after darren mustard <laughs> what are the best resources available online to learn the most about colour grading from start to finish? You mean apart from my YouTube channel? Apart from the excellent... Actually, no, to say that, that doesn't take you from start to finish. That's just random YouTube videos that oh, will not take you from start to finish. So I think the online resources from Blackmagic are great and they're free. There's a whole, you know, beginner's guide to colour grading in DaVinci Resolve on there. Uh, it's written by Daria, who's a you know, fantastic wealth of knowledge, really good friend. It's a, it's a really good course. And you can do that and you can do a little course at the end of it as well to just sort of test yourself and get certified. So I, I thoroughly recommend that. Cool. What do you think is the right way to learn? You've kind of already answered this one, but do you think it's a course? Do you think it's getting just trying, getting stuck in, throwing things yeah. around? Yeah, I mean, like magic resources online are gonna get you a good grounding. They're not gonna go into major amounts of detail. And obviously that's a one way street. So there's no ability to sort of ask questions or anything like that. So, um, you know, an online course is a great way to go, do your research on where you're getting that course from. Mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of good ones out there. The experience is going to come, you know, 
no two jobs are the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm, yeah, my experience tells me things like, you know, you might learn how to do keying correctly. And then I know looking at a certain shot, whether it's even worth doing a key on it or not through just through experience. Cause I've, I've been doing it a long time and you are just going to get better and better and better. There's no, sh there's no fast track. There's no shortcut. I think you can get to a good level very quick these days. There's plenty, there's so much resources out there. And even just if you're watching YouTube videos and stuff, if they're from a good source, you can get some good knowledge pretty quick. So you won't have the massive long learning curve that I had. There was no resources when I was starting out. There was nothing on YouTube. I, did, I mean, I don't even know where I got my information from. Sort of, you know, friends would speak on the phone. Remember that concept? <laughs> on the landline. <laughs> yeah. I just practice and play. You're not, you, you know, you're not going to do any damage. That's why. Well, you could do a lot of damage, actually. But it's, <laughs> it's, but it's not permanent damage. Yeah, you'll know what's wrong. Yeah. And that's the same with all of DaVinci Resolve, isn't it? It's get stuck in, click some buttons, see what yeah. happens. And if it looks horrible, just undo. Yeah. <laughs> Off you go. Yeah. And on that, if it looks great to you, I don't really care how you got there. Mm -hmm. If it looks great and your client's happy. There's no right or wrong way with Telegram. There's, no, there's no right or wrong. Thanks. There's better ways, but there's, there's no right or wrong. <laughs> what would be the first tool you'd advise someone to learn? Go to Color Management. Color management, 100%. Now, a lot of people find that quite daunting. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few episodes on my channel that hopefully explain that in layman's terms. But if you can get your head around color management, that's going to give you a really good head start technically. Um, if you're looking at color management and you're just like, I have no idea what is going on here, I would suggest that you start playing with uh, these tools, the sort of primary color wheels. You've got lift, gamma gain, which is shadow, midtones, highlights, if you like. But this one here, offset, this is actually adjusting the overall image. So this is gonna do the biggest first step for color grading. This is my first go-to tool. Okay, so I'm using this all the time. And if I lift up here, you'll see that I'm just lifting exposure, if you like. And if I move the little dot in the middle, I can make it warmer, cooler, that sort of thing. I'm gonna go back to color management. You haven't escaped it just yet. I could talk about color management for a long time. <laughs> yeah, want. it's probably me that's escaped it. <laughs> Do you have a preference or any advice in regards to using the built-in Resolve color management, the auto color management, or using a, a CST? CST, color space transform. Yeah. yeah, okay. So effectively, they're both gonna give you the same result. Mm -hmm. So first advice, it doesn't actually matter which. The automatic color management is happening before you start your grade and after you start your grade. The input side of it's happening before you grade, the output side's happening after you grade. With the CST route, color space transform route, I can control where it actually happens all right, in my node tree. So I tend to work with the CST workflow. It's pretty well documented on my channel. You can have a look at most of my episodes. I kind of explain it. Um, I just want to be in control of where it goes. And I do some quirky things as well that just take you out of, would take you out of your comfort zone. We don't need to go down there. But, uh, <laughs> um, but the, the, neither of them are incorrect. If you're using one or the other, you're, you're going down a good route. Got you. And on that very similar note, where do you put it? For me, I have one at the beginning and one at the end. Oh. Okay. And it's not strictly right at the beginning either, but for argument's sake and saving you an hour's explanation, <laughs> let's say it's at the beginning. And you certainly want to be grading under one. So if you're only going to, if, if, you, if you're saying start or end, I would be going end and grading under it. But I have one at the beginning, which takes me to a certain color space. And then at the end, I come from that color space back to my output color space, which is effectively what the auto color management is doing. Go on. All right, I'm just controlling where. Hey, I need to let you know that I wouldn't be able to make videos just like this one without the support from awesome channel sponsors like Audio. Audio is a music subscription service that has a highly curated catalogue of music and sound effects which you can use for basically any project. That license covers you for YouTube, podcasts, video games, films, and even TV. And there's a huge selection of music to pick from, covering all genres from pop, hip hop, rock, electric and everything in between and that audio pro license gives you unlimited downloads of all of that music plus that sound effects and it's available for a special price of just 59 bucks for your first year and anything that you download during that year you're licensed to continue using forever even after you cancel so to get started simply head over to audio.com forward slash alex there's a link down in the description below and then use the code alex70 at checkout Awesome. Right, let's get back to Darren, shall we? Cool, we're going to start talking a little bit more about hardware. Okay. So, what's the bare minimum hardware you would recommend for someone trying to get into colour grading? 
calibrating mold. Yeah. You certainly don't need all this stuff that I've got here, right? Bear in mind, this is, you know, I've not just done a massive shopping list and bought this in what, this is 17 years of accumulated stuff. My monitor is my, that's my hero monitor. I buy the best monitor you can possibly afford. That's where your money is best spent. IO box is other good investment. So I've got a, I've got a Ultra Studio 4K stream. They do ones that start at, I think it has to be Blackmagic, made by Blackmagic to work with DaVinci Resolve, but I think they start at 99 pounds. Uh, you just get the little IO boxes. That's gonna give you a better feed from your computer. I've got an episode on that as well, actually, but this gives you a better feed to your monitor. I need to be able to trust this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if that's wrong, it's got mm -hmm. no chance when it goes out into the rest of the world and gets viewed on people's random devices that are all sorts of colored <laughs> settings. <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. On a similar question, which kind of goes exactly against the answer you've just given, how could you correct or even check white balance if you know you're on an uncalibrated screen? Some people obviously are working on laptops or they have a monitor and that's kind of all they, they have at the moment. Any tips to try and get the, the most out of a bad situation? Yeah, get it calibrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so if you're, on a, if you're on a screen and you don't know if it's calibrated or not, I mean, you're, you're still kind of working a little bit blind, but you can use the scopes down here. So you'll find that you might be defaulting to this keyframe thing. If you just click on here, you get your scopes. Waveform is going to show me my brightness. So you've got your black level at the bottom and your whites at the top, but it's not going to show me color balance. Okay, let's just show me brightness. So if I go to my vectorscope, that trace in the middle, in fact, if I press this, I can pop that out. There we go, so it's a bit bigger. That trace in the middle is reading the saturation levels in this image. So if I, let me just desaturate that shot for you. You'll see that all you get is a dot in the middle. There's no saturation. So if I take that off, my saturation is leaning towards red and yellow, these two little boxes here. So I know that this shot is slightly warm, okay, but I still can't really tell if I'm white balanced or not. And bear in mind, I might not want whites to be white. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what I'm gonna do is switch to this one. If I switch to my parade, this one here is measuring my brightness and it's showing me the red, green, and blue channels. All right, so what I can do here is look at uh, the top here, is my highlights. So red and green are kind of at the same point. Green is sitting a little bit lower, say, but blue is considerably lower in the highlights. Okay, so in the shadows, it's a bit more balanced. So I know that we're definitely a bit warm. There's less blue in the highlights, which will give us a warmer image. So for me to balance these out, I would need to take something like my offset tool or my gain tool here and just push towards blue. And you can see that starts balancing up. And I did that just looking at the scopes and that actually looks better now. If I switch that, switch that node on and off, you see it's actually cleaned it up just by looking at the scoping. Excellent. If you want your whites white, mm -hmm. these have to line up. That's the law. Excellent. That's a great tip. There you go. All right. The next one, which is very, very similar. You've already talked about white balance. What about skin tones? So skin tones, you can measure on a vector scope. Mm -hmm. So my scopes, just to point this out, I mean, ideally you want these on a separate monitor because you're going to use them a lot. Once you get used to what they do and how they work, they really become like your best friend, okay? It's a combination of looking at my output monitor and this, but I've got a dedicated system for scopes over here. So I'm actually running on a completely separate feed on a separate bit of software. I use a thing called Omniscope. It's no better quality than the Resolve scopes, but I've got more types of scope. So I can actually, I, I've, got, I've got better tools, but it's the same information. Okay, so the RGB parade that I'm looking at here is exactly the same measurement on here. I've just got different types of scopes as well. So I've got a skin tone line on my vector scope up permanently. Okay, and I'll show you that. If you go to the vector scope, which is measuring, as we mentioned before, saturation, and then what I can do is click on the settings here and I can say show skin tone indicator. And this line is a general line as to where skin tone should be sitting. Okay, it's not the law. People are obsessed that it's got to sit exactly on that line. It's a guide. Okay, and we can see here quite clearly there's my skin tone. Okay, and it's sitting just slightly above that line, but not to a point where I would be too worried about it. Mm -hmm. You might have it, but yeah, it's a very cool atmosphere, it might be very dark. It's, all those things need to come into consideration as well. Got but it. it's, it's, a, it's a good tool, especially when you're starting out. Yeah, aim for it and then go from there. Yeah. Awesome, thank you very much. Talk to me next about nodes. How many is too many? When should I make another node? I know that's a few questions, but <laughs> any sort of real quick fire just yeah, rules sure. of thumb, All right. tips, tricks when you when you yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I would start with just serial nodes, okay? And just think of it like layers, if you like, okay? So I, I work on what's called a fixed node tree. So my node tree looks the same for every program I'm doing, but that keeps me disciplined, but it's quite an advanced technique. I think when you're starting out, just get, you know, node number one, well, I've already got two nodes that I've done something on here. So node number three, 
and I might just do something in here. I might just want to warm this shot back up again. We sort of cooled it down earlier. I might want to take out a bit of saturation, for example. This is not really my sort of regular working way, but when I get to there and if I stop to think, I'm like, what do I do next? I just add another node. So you got right, and the advantage of that, so let's just, I've already got them pre-built here, but if I go to node number four, what you would do is right click on here and say, add serial node okay. or option S, sorry. That would add another serial node. And then you can just start doing some other stuff. So let's say, for example, I was doing a little bit of curve, something like that, I'm being random here. But if I decide I don't like that, I can switch this node on and off just to try it. I mean, that's where we were before, but I've not lost that information. If I'd done all that on one node, mm -hmm. I, when I switch the node on and off, I, I'm taking going off too right many levels. To yeah. yeah, so this yeah. is like, that's the little move I did there. This is just the curve. So it means I can just switch it on and off and say whether I like it or not. And go, yeah, okay, I like it, but it's a bit heavy. So let's just pull it back a bit. Something like that. Yeah. I'm stopping to think of an idea. Next note. And so once again, it's there's no necessary right or wrong way. It's whatever works for you. What's your workflow? Yeah, you can do that. I mean, the majority of my grade is done within three or four notes. The, the real bulk of the work. Everything else is just little stuff that I'm doing. It might be Tiny little, little windows, um, texture tools, that sort of thing. Um, but you should be able to get there in you know, three or four notes. But if, if it takes you 20 notes to get there, it doesn't matter. It's not doing any damage. Mm -hmm. That's really good to know because I think sometimes you see it with massive node trees and you go, is, is that what you actually need or is that yeah. the real sort of 99th percent stuff? So if you look at my yeah. fixed node trees, there actually can be, I've got a few different ones, but let's argue they're 20 nodes. Mm -hmm. I might only be using four of them. Got you. So I have empty nodes. In fact, even on here, this node number five here has got nothing on it. It's not doing any damage, it's just sitting there. It's just there if you were to need it. Yeah, but I would build it up from scratch. I would ignore all these that I've got here. Just give one node. Maybe start with offset, second node, a bit of contrast, third node, a bit of uh, saturation, for example. Got it. And just build it up from there. Makes sense. And when you start with getting into parallels and stuff, I have got a pretty good episode on my channel, or I think it's a pretty good episode. Links down below. Moving on. I'll buy you lunch. Thank you much. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the micro panel being the, the entry level panel to yep. get into cover grading, would you recommend it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, any panel, I would thoroughly recommend. So, you know, get your monitor first, next thing's your panel, okay? It's gonna help you. Let's move on to that next node. We've got a new idea coming up, so let's just move on to that. If I wanna start adjusting these controls, I'm just using my pen and tablet. I don't use a mouse, I use a pen and tablet, but it's the same as using a mouse. And I'm trying to control that. And these little, what look like little tiny moves are actually doing a lot of image manipulation there, okay? So using the panel, I can control these using the balls and I get much finer control. Okay, it also means I can do two things at once. So I can control like this, instead of going, I want a little bit of gain and then I want to bring my lift down a bit as two separate items. So I really like the panel for that. Obviously I've got the advanced panels. This is giving me pretty much one touch operation for everything in the color page. You don't need this. The micro panel will do great. The micro panel is primaries only. So it's pretty much sort of these tools, saturation, temperature and that sort of stuff as well. The next one up, which is the mini panel, mini, yeah. will give you secondary control as well. So you can start adjusting things like keys and uh, I think it's got tracking and stuff on there as well. But any panel's good. You can even do third party ones as well. I mean, they start at a few hundred quid. Mm -hmm. um, Tangent do some. I think DaVinci Resolve supports quite a few different uh, control panels. But the micro one is a particularly good one because it's the same technology on the balls and rings as the mini and the advanced panel. So it's really, and it's really well good. And obviously it's totally designed to work with DaVinci Resolve. And it's relatively affordable, obviously compared to the advanced panel. Anyway. I was buying again now. I mean, I've had this about I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years. Th those panels weren't available then. If I was buying now, I'd buy a mini panel mm -hmm. and something like a Stream Deck to go with it to give me extra functionality. Oh, that was one of my next questions. Any other bits of gear that you'd recommend? I suggest that was Stream Deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is great. This is the 32, but I'm onto Stream Deck XL. Some pretty random stuff on the front page, to be honest with you, <laughs> like my radio channels and that sort of stuff. But I do have it configured for DaVinci Resolve as well, even though I've got the advanced panel. And I've got some other nice tools, like the speed edits is great mm -hmm. uh, for, the, yeah, for the editing page. Um, if I go to my color settings on here, these are my own programs. You can buy templates and stuff like that, but I've just got ones that complement the advanced panel. So things like my printer lights, which is effectively these things down here and the offset tool. I can do that on the panel, but I'd like to have these 
couple of buttons on here. I find it just a little bit more tactile, a bit more user friendly on here. I've got playheads on here. Again, I kind of kind of do this stuff on the events panel, but sometimes it's a two or three switch. Yeah. Whereas on here, I'm just straight into it. It's just nice and easy. So this is a great compliment to, particularly on the smaller panels, you could load memories in there. So if you were to get either the mini or the micro along with something like the stream deck, it'd probably be a pretty nice little combo. So it's true, Brits, all we eat is fish and chips. That's all we eat. Roast dinners on Sunday, fish and chips six days a week. What are we having for dinner? Not fish and chips. <laughs> So next one, how essential do you think color grading is for online content creators, aka YouTubers like us? Do you grade your YouTube footage or do you focus more on efficiency than, than anything else? I don't grade my footage. Oh, controversial. <laughs> um, I was thinking that as you said it. So uh, <laughs> the only reason I don't grade it is a, a for just speed. Okay, I'm normally so relieved that I've actually got around to making a YouTube episode for a start and then actually edited it and done it and then you've got working all the thumbnails and all that sort of stuff. So I've now got to a point, or I've been doing it for a long time, is the look is set in my camera. So I've got Sony a7S III. Uh, I don't use S-Log on it. I use one of the Cine profiles. I've just tweaked it a little bit and obviously my lighting setup stays uh, exactly the same each time. So for me, it's quite easy. The, the look's already there. I mean, also, if you're talking about online content, we do a lot of branded content here. I mean, I don't just do TV stuff. It's, we do a lot of music videos and uh, branded content. That gets the same treatment as a TV commercial would. So yeah, but it's going on YouTube. I think if you're talking about content creators specifically, which you mentioned, I think if, if, they're, working, if, if they're always filming in the same environment and it does need a grade, you could build a grade and you could literally grab that as a still and it's there for future reference. You don't have to grade it once. And once you've got a look that you like, you can literally film all your YouTube episodes and just apply that grade to everything. Is that the recommended way to grab a preset and then, you know, share it amongst? Yeah, I mean, projects? what you can do actually, you've got these things called stills, but if you go down to power grades, or in fact, you can create your own. If I right click here, you say add power grade album. And if I right click and drop that into a power grade, what will happen is when I create a new project, that still will still be available across all the projects. Whereas in stills, they are project specific. Yeah, it's the color page version of a power bin. Hence Correct. the name. Yeah. There you go. That's I used to name. grade some of my earlier YouTube stuff, but that was because I was, I mean, it just looked terrible anyway. And it still looks terrible now, to be honest. <laughs> I'll try to make sure that this video doesn't look terrible with one of my awful grades, because it might Appreciate shed it. some bad light on you. <laughs> no, it's your channel, it ain't gonna look bad on me. Darren taught me how to grade this footage. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much I can teach you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next one. Lots. Mm -hmm. Discuss. Good, bad, <laughs> off you go. Discuss. It's been discussed <laughs> for years, hasn't it? Um, good. Good LUTs are good. Mm -hmm. No problem with that. Uh, bad LUTs are bad. So uh, you need to know where your LUTs have come from. All right. So LUTs that you're just buying off random YouTubers that you don't know that they've been what's called stress tested, I would say, uh, can look great, but can also fall apart very quick. So they might look great on your first 10 shots, and you're gonna to come to another shot and you're gonna like, what's that weird blip there? That's a bad LUT. Most Hollywood feature films would be would be graded under a LUT, they'd have a show LUT on there. So it's a LUT that's been specifically designed to work for that feature, but also won't be doing any damage at all to any color grading that they're doing. Uh, I would suggest if you want to look at buying LUTs, there's some good people out there who, I mean, Cullen Kelly has some LUTs that are great. Uh, he's a really good channel. Uh, Jason Bodak, he has some LUTs that you can buy. So they're reputable people, they're color scientists, they know what they're doing. So nothing wrong with LUTs as long as you get it from the right place. Yeah. Makes sense. I suppose if you get getting from the wrong place and you like it, there's also nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But technically you could be getting tripped up pretty quick. Got gotcha. you. Last question. What's next for Darren Lostin? I'm quirky. Da -da -da. Well, I'm coming up to my 100,000. I'm getting pretty excited yeah. about that. I and mean, I've got a little bit to go yet, but my 100,000 subscribers will be... What are you on now? I'm really looking forward to it, about 88. Okay. Oh yeah, not long to go. Um, I used to look like immediately in the morning, go like that. I mean, I've, I've kind of calmed down on that as well now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that happening. So I'll be coming up for three years, end of this month, hit the 100,000, I'll probably retire then. <laughs> no more. <laughs> I don't think YouTube's ever going to let me retire, is it? Nah, but, uh, no, it's, it's, the, it's the best thing I ever did. I'm so much fun with it. And just, you know, making friends, like you, you, know, you become a really good friend. It's, it's, it's great. I love the whole, the whole The community YouTube. behind it is wicked, isn't it? Yeah. It's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. I never thought three years ago I'd be doing it and it work as well as it did. Yeah. Cool. That's it. 
All Thank right. you very much. You're very welcome. Mr. Martin. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Beer. And now we're going to go to the pub. Find some food and have a beer. <laughs> yeah. <Watch. laughs> All right, nice one. Cheers. Cheers, mate. So that's good after all that talking. Until next time. Next time? Yeah, next time. I'm coming again. Getting hot. <laughs>